welcome to Miss Rose's Storytime. We're reading Elizabeth George Spear, The Bronze Bow. And um, we are on page, we're in chapter 12. And chapter 12 is on page 133. Late one afternoon, a village boy came into the shop with a scythe to be mended. He had a bony, weather-toughened face under a shock of straight black hair, a defiant, touchy alertness, and a blackened eye that roused Daniel's curiosity. As, Dan as Daniel suggested, jerking an elbow towards the bench near the door, the boy, unable to sit for more than a moment, resumed his nervous pacing. Daniel set to work, blowing the waning fire with the bellows, heating and pounding straight the blade, then applying the sandstone to the nicks that the pebbly flat land had left. From time to time, he glanced at the boy. Daniel seldom had words to spare for his customers. He did the work they required of him and took their money, not caring that he had a reputation for being surly. Today, for the first time, he was prompted to speak. For one thing, the boy was about his own age, and for another, he looked like a fighter. When he could make himself heard, Daniel attempted a joke. Must have been some must have been quite a scrap you were in. There was no answering grin, but Daniel tried again. What did give you what did give I'm sorry, what did you give him in return? There was a pause. Then what could I? The boy burst out. There were five of them. Daniel's eyebrows lifted. He bent over his work. My own friends? Bitterness rasped through the boy's voice, waited and jumped on the coming home from the field last night. Why? Because my father has gone to work for Somner, the tax collector. No wonder the boy looked defiant. It was a contemptible business for a Jew to hire himself out to collect the taxes the Romans did not stoop to collect for themselves. There are better ways of earning a living, Daniel observed. He's, he's worn out trying. Last year it was the locusts, and this year some cockle seed got into the grain and the crop is worth har isn't worth harvesting. He could never meet the taxes. Daniel said nothing. He could have sold my sister. There would have been no shame in that, but he's too soft-hearted. That's a hard choice, Daniel agreed. They forced it on us, the crushed, ro cursed Romans. The land would feed us well enough if we were rid of them. Daniel leaned closer to the stone and carefully ground out a slight roughness. But it's not true what they said, the boy went on. My father would never put one penny of the taxes in his own pocket. Daniel did not answer. A tax collector might start out honest enough, he reflected, but a man weak enough to take the job at all would find it hard to resist the easy pickings. He, la he felt embarrassed. It was a bad thing for a boy to have to be ashamed of his own father. I guess this will do, he said, rubbing his thumb along the blade. He knew the boy did not want, sympath want his sympathy. The boy paid him and moved towards the door, hesitating. Daniel guessed the shrinking with which he looked out into the twilight street. Any chance they'll be waiting again, he asked. 
The boy shrugged, but his eyes looked sick. Hold on a minute, Daniel suggested. When I close the shop, I've got to deliver an axe head. We can go along together. I can take care of myself, the boy flashed. I don't doubt that. What's your name, by the way? Nathan. Then come along with me, Nathan. There's something I'd like to tell you about. There was not much use talking over to one talking there was not much use talking however to one whose ears were straining for every sound on the dark roadway daniel could almost feel the tense muscles of the boy beside him but he observed with approval that the nervous stride did not falter he gave up an empty attempt to talk and walked on in silence savoring the keen pleasure the thought of the coming attack. He had not realized how much he had missed the rising prickle of anticip anticipation. The rush came quickly out of the darkness, six or seven, Daniel noted, even while his first sent the first comer sprawling. With a shout of sheer enjoyment, he caught two others, one with each hand. In the dark, there was a shriek. The blacksmith! A frantic wrench and the sound of tearing cloth, and one of his captives darted off in his tunic, leaving his cloak in Daniel's hand. The other teeth rattling from a shake and a kick in that would be remembered stumbled after him. Then Daniel stood watching while his new friend dealt e efficiently with two young attackers. Not bad, he com commented when the whole pack had slunk into the shadows. You need to tighten your guard. Now that's over, and you can pay attention to what I have to say. How would you like to use those fists of yours for a good purpose? So Daniel won his first recruit in the village. Nathan, son of the new tax collector. As though Daniel's very eagerness had somehow acted as a single be signal between them, a few days later, Joel walked into the smithy, bringing with him a recruit of his own. How did you know where to find me? Daniel demanded, eyeing with curiosity the slender, scholarly boy who accompanied his friend. I ran into your friend Simon, Joel told him. After just the slightest hesitation, he told me you were looking out for his shop. He suggested I come to see you. A good thing, Daniel said. I was wondering how I could get to Caperum. There's businesses enough for two men here. He tried to sound matter of fact, but he could not keep the pride out of his voice. Joel showed a flattering interest in the shop he wandered about picking up the tools weighing bars of metal from one hand to another he was impressed with the shiny gleam of newly finished of a newly finished blade i brought someone who wants to join with us he said kimuel feels as we do daniel looked uncomfortably at the newcomer the boy was plainly wealthy and used to having his own way. There was an edge of dis disdain in his voice and in, and in his proud, handsome face. Yet there was something else, too. The new boy whirled suddenly round at him. Do you mean to fight them, he demanded, or are you playing a game? I came today to see if you are serious. We are serious said Daniel Levely. What right have you to ask? Because I am tired of words, the boy answered. Everywhere men talk and argue, while Israel lies helpless at the feet of Rome. Where is our courage? Why does no one dare to step forth? If you mean to fight them, then I am with you, but I have no use for children's games. A feverous light burned in the dark eyes. He reminded Daniel of a panther, lean and dark and fiery, 
and his own fire leaped up to meet this boy's. He forgot his suspicion. You're welcome here, Camille, he said. You'll find we're not playing a game. Yes, Joel had chosen well. Strong arms and muscles were easy to find. A fiery spirit was not so common. Presently, Nathan stopped by on his way home from the field, and he had formed a habit, as he had formed a habit of doing. Already, Nathan had lost his resentful air, a first awkward, at first awkward in the presence of the city boys. He soon surrendered to Joel's friendliness. Daniel disconnected the bellows, banked the fire out for the night, bolted the door, and the band of four held its first meeting, certain of Simon's approval. Daniel offered the smithy as a gathering place. They agreed to meet on the third day of each week. If you want members, Nathan offered, I could name you ten here in our village who would give their right arms to join you. Daniel hesitated. I've thought about that, he told them. I know there are plenty. If word went out tomorrow, half the village would probably be with us before night. Some because they love Galilee or hate the Romans, and some just because they love a good fight. But would they lose heart? The trouble is we can't fight tomorrow. We've got to work slowly, and it may take a long time. How long? Camille demanded. We must be strong enough so that we cannot fail. Daniel tried to remember how Rosh had talked to them in the cave, wetting their impatience but always holding it back, leashed for the day to come. He saw how much he had still to learn from Rosh. Right now, we need members who will be willing to work without any reward. He went on, not looking at Kimuel, but speaking chiefly to him. We've got to be absolutely sure we can trust them, no matter what happens. Then we shouldn't take too many right away, Joel said thoughtfully. We should not make it too easy, Camille spoke. We only value the things we pay for. Who has money to pay, Nathan bristled. That would keep out all the village, all the villagers. I was not speaking of money, Camille answered with a touch of scorn. I meant we must be committed altogether without any reservation. Only that way can we be sure. We will each take the oath, Joel reminded him. His friend was not satisfied. An oath can mean one thing to one and something altogether different to another, he argued. Daniel suspected that he argued hab habitually. That means like out of habit. And enjoyed it. Like the scribes who debated the five points of the law. I know, Nathan sprang to his feet. He seized a rod of iron from the wall near him. We can brand ourselves. That way, we would know. Are you forgetting the law? The scholar cut in icily. Cut in icily. You shall not print any marks upon you. It was exactly as though he had pulled his cloak tighter to avoid condemnation. Peasant, his tone said unmistakably. Daniel heart sank. Already his little army was b behaving like the men in the cave. We don't need a brand, Joel spoke quickly in the reasonable, friendly way that made everything he said so convincing. If we choose carefully, we can trust each other. We will carry the sign of the bow in our minds. You know from the Song of David, He trains my hands for war so that my arms can bend a bow of bronze. That is our password. 
Within three weeks, the four members had increased to seven, then to nine, twelve, sixteen. Young men would meet each other on the village streets in the school at Cape Room. Did you ever see a bow made of bronze? They might ask in passing, or they would drop in at the smithy and pick up a lump of metal. It would make a good bow, they would say. The password gave them pride and pleasure. They went around, they went around together by the sign. No. They were, my book is like a misprint right there in this um, sentence on page 139. They were pound together, uh, or no, it should probably be bound. The first letter's missing, and it says O-U-N-D, so I'm thinking it says bound. They were bound together, there we go. By the sign. On the first day of Ab, 21 boys crowded the smithy. Daniel looked around at them with a surge of elation. When can we tell Rosh, Joel demanded, eager for another glimpse of his hero. Not yet, Daniel answered. We could not tell even Joel how he... He could not eat, he could not tell even Joel how he dreamed of the moment when he would tell Rosh. Now while Joel read aloud to the listening boys the thrilling accounts he had shared with Daniel in the passageway of David and of Judas Iscariot, Daniel throughout Daniel thought how he would lead Rosh down the mountain and confront him with an army ready for his command. Then Rosh would no longer be an outcast. Then everyone would recognize the leader they had longed for and the day would be very near. On the morning after the third meeting, the fair-haired Roman soldier appeared again at the smithy. This time he had a broken stirrup to be mended. He paid no attention to the sullen scowl that showed that his business was unwelcome. He stood, his feet planted well apart in that Roman pose they seemed to learn young. Looking deliberately about the shop at the shelves of metal bars, the tools hanging along the wall, the door that Daniel had instantly shut between them and the inner room. Daniel kept his eyes on his work, fighting down a compulsion, compulsion to find out what the man might be looking at. Could there possibly be a sign of last night's meeting? He did not draw an easy breath till the Roman, taking his time about it, finally clanked through the door mounted his horse and rode off. Then searching the room frantically, he could not he he could find nothing that would possibly have drawn the man's suspicion. Had it been his imagination that the man was looking for something? The Roman returned, sometimes on the very day of a meeting, often on odd days between. He came now with work for his fellow legionnaires, or with ridiculous excuses to have some perfectly sound bit of harness checked for a flaw. Once or twice, Daniel, hearing the hoofbeats in the street, looked up to see the man ride slowly by his door, and then almost immediately, so soon, the man could scarcely have turned his horse, ride slowly back again. He discovered the prints of a horse's hoofs in the soft earth of the alleyway that ran along the garden wall where there was no possible reason to ride a horse. No question now, the, ho the house was being watched. The meeting place would have to be changed. A new recruit, son of a farmer in the village, offered a solution. 
He led Daniel to an abandoned watchtower in his father's cucumber field, a small round stone house in which the whole family had once lived during the time of harvest to watch less, less thieves to spoil the ripening crop. Below the tower, a shaft that had been cut, designed... Daniel suspected for hiding part of the crop from the count of the tax collector and made a fine place to store the weapons they planned soon to have. The tower could be approached from many sides across the field of vines. It was an ideal meeting place. Abruptly, almost as soon as they shifted the meeting place, the Romans stopped coming. Wearily, they stationed a guard near the new headquarters, taking turns at the duty. Not a sign of the soldier was ever reported. Luck was with them, Daniel decided. Still, there was something about it that made him uneasy. Well, that's very interesting. I hope you enjoyed Chapter 12. Please remember to read 30 minutes every day. When my children were little, we used to read after lunch. So, I hope you have a great day. No, we also read a little bit during bedtime. But our big story time was after lunch. Alright, anyway. <laughs> I hope you have a great Valentine's Day this week. And I hope you're enjoying the, um, the book. And um, please like, share, and subscribe. And if there's any books you'd like me to read, I you can mention them and I will consider them. Take care. God bless.